Hi class, Bill Berry continuing with the second demo for week 9. In the first video we talked a little bit about polymorphism and we answered a couple of important questions. For instance, can I refer to a student instantiated object but using a person reference? The answer was yes. Then the next question was what behaviors do we get? And the answer is you still get student behaviors. Now you can't use methods that are specific to the student class because that reference doesn't know about them, right? A person reference doesn't know you have those methods because they're below it in a subclass, but all the overridden methods come into action, so you get everything in terms of those overrides working correctly, exactly as you'd expect, so that was cool. The next question was, can I have a single array that includes students and teachers? The answer was yes. We added some code that created an array of person references, and then we added various students and teachers and etc. to them, and then we used that to uh, cycle through all of our teachers and students and make sure that everything was working as expected, and they did. Again, polymorphism makes this all work beautifully. Now, the other thing we tried is we tried to use a student specific method on a person reference. Can't do that, so we know that that's not uh, not something that you can do. Now, we're left with a couple other questions that we that will really take us to talking about the last objects or the last uh, concepts rather that uh, that we want to talk about here in this in this chapter. So, the next question is what does it mean to instantiate a person and can we do that? So let's come to main and let's just for fun uh, try to instantiate a new person. So I can say something like this person test person 2 equals new person and I'm going to say this is Dean Davis. Odd how all of these people Dino at gmail.com. All these people have the same first letter, last name, first name. Hmm. Okay, so we have created a new person, but the question is, what does that even mean? That compiles, that'll run, everything's fine. But are there such persons at the college that are not anything specific? They're not students, they're not teacher, they're not staff, they're not anything, they're just plain persons? I don't know. That doesn't sound quite right, does it? We really don't want to be able to instantiate something directly from the person class. We'd like to instantiate only from the subclasses because it just doesn't make sense to us, right? It's just there is no such thing as a person. So we really would like this to be illegal, right? It works fine and it'll, it'll uh, succeed in our case, but we really don't want to do this. So here's the concept. Let's go back to our diagram. Right now, all of these classes are called concrete, right? They're known as concrete classes because you can instantiate all of them. There's no problem with any of that. But we're going to learn a new concept now, and that is the concept of an abstract class. Notice right now, person is declared as a normal, ordinary class. Up at the top, it says public class person. But if we want to make a person class purely an idea, purely a superclass from which you can inherit, but never something that should be instantiated, it's really easy to do. Abstract public class person. All right? That compiles. Everything is great. But now, if we come back to main and we try to compile again, it tells us very clearly person is abstract. You can't go instantiate that. So that keeps it all exactly what we want, right? It makes it work exactly as we want. It doesn't let us instantiate person because it just doesn't make sense. And in fact, if we look at our diagram now, you'll see that person is marked as an abstract class. That makes perfect sense. So this is a great example. You create an abstract class knowing that you and expecting that people are going to inherit. They're going to extend this class, create subclasses, and they must do that, in fact, to make use of what is provided in the person class. That's called an abstract class. So that takes care of the problem, and it just took one line of code, one little change, calling it an abstract class in, instead of a concrete class, which is the default. So cool idea. Next idea is, and, and by the way, if you create another class and, um, and you try to inherit from person, it works great, right? It works just fine. So everything will work exactly. Notice everything else compiles, so it works great. Okay, the next question that we had is, the code for a valid ID in person looks like a placeholder. Remember that when we created this code, Right? Go back and look at our person code, and you'll see that we have ID validation, but we really had no clue what to put here. 
Why? Because we know the rules for all the different types of people around the college are different when it comes to assigning IDs. So we didn't know what to put here. In fact, the thing that we put, the reason, or the, the uh, fact that we put it in here at all is kind of dumb. We know that we need to have ID validation for each of the subclasses, but what we don't need is to have this placeholder here that does nothing, right? We, we actually want to say, look, the idea is here, you need to have this validation routine present. The method needs to be here, but we're not going to tell you exactly how to do it. We're just going to make you do it, right? This is an interesting idea. So in this class, we're going to say, look, I want to tell you, you got to have this when you inherit from this class. When you, inst when you uh, have a subclass of this class, you've got to have a validation routine, but we're not going to tell you how to do it. So how do you do that? Well, guess what? The concept of abstract works just as well here, but the difference is we put no body, right? We actually put no body here. So the method is declared, but it is not implemented. And we put the word abstract. Again, what does that mean? It's an idea. You have to do it in subclasses, and it's going to have this signature, right? It's going to be called valid ID, and it's going to have a string called ID as its parameter, right? So you must implement it in subclasses, but you figure out how to do it. We don't have any code here. So that takes care of this, and this is really cool, and we have, in fact, implemented this perfectly. Now, interestingly, if we create a new project or a new class. Let's do this real quick just to prove to ourselves that, that uh, Java will watch this for us. Let's create a class called uh, staff. All right? So we have a staff class and we're going to uh, put it right here and we're going to say extends person, right? The same thing. Again, forgive me Java Docs for not paying attention to you. And then I'm going to get rid of most of the stuff here. And I know I need a constructor so I'm going to say public staff uh, string name string uh, email and I know I'm gonna have to call the super class so I call super name email okay now I think I'm done I think I have a shell that works but if I try to do this and try to compile it look what I get staff is not abstract and it does not override an abstract method valid ID from person in other words you haven't completed all of what the contract requires you to do. You must have a routine called valid ID. So I'm going to have to create a private method, right? I'm going to have to have a private method called private boolean valid ID and it's going to have to take a string parameter. Right? Now I'm going to just leave it blank for now. I'm just going to return true. I'm not going to put any good code in here. Right? But in essence, now it's going to compile um, and let's see, attempting to make a list public. Okay, what do I need to do here? And of course, the one issue here is that this needs to be public, not private. There we go. So now that's going to compile. So you notice that when we created a new class that extends person, even though it's an abstract class, of course, we know we can extend it and <clears throat> Since we have an abstract declaration for the valid ID method, we know that we will have to implement it. It has to become concrete in a concrete class. So that proves to ourselves that our idea was correct about using not only an abstract class, but also the abstract method. Now, the last question was, <clears throat> we have a two-string method in person that's perfectly good. We decided that for students and teachers we really wanted to do something else, but what we did was just override it. We didn't make use of the fact that person already had given us a starting point. So I want to show you one other thing that I think will be useful. Okay, notice down here in student, right now we have code that starts with a blank slate and it generate some additional stuff about how many classes a student has completed and what the grade average is. But rather than starting with this, why don't we start the following way, which I think actually uh, makes a little more sense. Rather than starting with a blank slate, why don't we simply call the super classes two string method instead? That way we get whatever they 
the, that class had, which was some of the basic information about names and emails and IDs and things like that. And then we can simply tack stuff onto it by adding to that. So here's the interesting piece here is you call super dot to string. And we can do the same thing in the teacher class, right? So in the teacher class, we're going to do the same thing. We'll start with the super classes to string method. And then we'll tack on the other stuff. Now, when we go to compile all of this, it should make some sense. Let's go back to main and make sure we've done the right stuff here. We have this, this uh, array, that should be fine. And we're grabbing out person index. Let me just make sure everything else looks good. Uh, we have set an ID. I think everybody should be good. So now when we compile and run this, let's just compile the whole thing and let's run main again. And let's see what we get out. All right, so there's some mess in terms of the line spacing. We should probably do something about that. But you'll notice that we have our first, in fact, let's clear this and just make sure we get a really clean output just so we don't we don't worry. So we still will have some cleanup to do, but you'll notice uh, we have Bobby Brown's information here, and it says Bobby's completed two courses so far and has a current grade average here. Here's an instructor, Samantha Smith, and she's teaching Algebra 2 this quarter. And here's Chrissy Caldwell. Now we still have some extra prints. That's what we're getting. We have some extra print lines that we'd want to go get rid of, right? We've got all these extra ones, so we'll want to comment those out. F8, F8, F8. There we go. So that will be better. Uh, we'll re recompile that and we'll go and clean that up, make sure that what we're getting out is exactly what we want. <clears throat> and in fact, I'm going to clear that just to make absolutely sure that everything is perfect for us. There we go. So again, there's a little bit of spacing here, but you'll notice we got three people out and we got what the person class provided in terms of the two string and then we just tacked on some specifics for each of the subclasses. So that kind of brings us to the end of the questions that we had left for ourselves. We used uh, polymorphism here to uh, create an array of person class objects, the references, and those references were to different subclasses of objects. So we used a student and we had a teacher, uh, but polymorphism meant that we got the right overridden methods run regardless of the type of reference. We could also put them all in an array and that array can be of type reference to a person. And then even though we run that th uh, through, we get again the overridden method. So polymorphism does the magic and makes the right thing happen. We also looked at the case that we could instantiate, we could instantiate a person and we decided that really wasn't what we wanted. A person is really an idea, not a concrete class, so we made it an abstract class. That solved that problem. Next we looked at the valid ID method and we said, you know, person really can't do its job there. It, it really has nothing to offer, but it may want to stipulate that you have to have it in derived classes. So we made that an abstract method and did not provide any kind of body. So that means that the subclasses must provide a body, must provide that method, and they must override it and provide a body. So we did that too. And then we also looked at two-string last but not least, and we said, look, it's okay to call a superclass method. Even though we're overriding it, we can call the superclass method to get some of the goodness that it has there, and then we can add to it as we did with two-string. So that's a mouthful, and it's also a lot of concepts that we covered in this last couple weeks of videos. So take a look at that, read the chapter carefully, ask questions if you have them, and uh, lots of good stuff you can do here. Now, we'll also talk a little bit about interfaces coming up soon, and that's a slightly different concept, uh, but the design questions become interesting. In this case, the person, student, teacher uh, idea made sense, but we'll talk about how uh, things might be implemented with interfaces, and we'll also talk briefly about the design concepts. How do you know for sure that inheritance is the right thing? So thanks for watching these videos, and we will see you soon in forum or online.